Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We are on page 1228, 1229. We are now at the conclusion of our Unit 6 study and we are comparing literary works, taking a look at the um, uh, Damon Pythias text that we, that we just looked at and Maupassant's Two Friends from the perspective of theme and moral dilemma and theme. Uh, again, on page 1228, noticing that chart that's provided there. Again, a moral dilemma, a situation in which potential actions conflict with the character's idea of right and wrong. Now, Maupassant, it's, it's somehow fitting that we would be finishing our sophomore study together in Unit 6 with the writer who we began our freshman experience with together. You'll remember Maupassant, the great writer of The Necklace, that story about the woman who gets the necklace and then goes off to uh, the party, loses the necklace, works for 10 years to pay back the necklace with her husband, and then of course realizes at the end of the story that in fact the necklace was only worth 50 bucks. And of course the ironies that are involved at the end of the story. Maupassant, of course, great believer in the power of the surprise ending. So I would write that one down at 2B right away. Let's meet one more time, Maupassant, on 1229. His dates, 1850 to 1893. In his short stories, Maupassant often focuses on the environment in which his characters live. The outcome of events in his work is determined by forces beyond a character's control, such as family history, social circumstances, character's basic disposition. His stories provide a fascinating record of 19th century life. Maupassant seemed destined for success, a gifted writer born into an aristocratic family. He won the attention of famous authors while he was still a young man. He soon became famous in his own right. Unfortunately, his career was cut short by illness. Maupassant died while still in his early 40s, yet he left a fortune to every future reader, 300 short stories. It is my hope that with the reading of not just this story, uh, but the necklace, that you'll find yourself interested in going on to maybe read more of Maupassant's great, great stories. Now, I'm reading with you on 1233 some background information. The following story, and this is important for you to read the story well, the following story is set during the Franco-Prussian War, a conflict between France and Germany that began on July 19, 1870. The Germans won a series of victories, one of which ended in the capture of the French leader Napoleon III. On September 19, 1870, the French army established a blockade around Paris. Movement in and out of the city was severely restricted. Led by a provisional government and plagued by famine and hopelessness, Paris managed to hold out until January 28, 1871, when the city did surrender. As Maupassant's story begins, the city is on the verge of surrender. I'm with you now on page 1234, and let's enjoy this story. In this story now, we're going to have again a story of friendship. We're going to, of course, use the Damien Pythias story as kind of background to compare. Let's just enjoy the reading of the story, pausing momentarily at level one, just as we have done. Two friends, a great, a great text, a great challenging text. Two Friends by Guy de Maupassant, translated by Gordon R. Silver. The following story is set during the Franco-Prussian War. Beginning on July 19, 1870, the war had resulted from the Prussian Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck's belief that a war with France would strengthen the bond between the German states, along with French Emperor Napoleon III's feeling that a successful conflict with Prussia would help him to gain support among the French people. As it turned out, the French army was no match for the German forces. After a series of victories, one of which ended in the capture of Napoleon III, the German army established a blockade around Paris on September 19, 1870. Led by a provisional government, Paris managed to hold out until January 28, 1871, though the city's inhabitants were plagued by famine and a sense of hopelessness. As Maupassant's story begins, the city is on the verge of surrender. Paris was blockaded, starved, in its death agony. Sparrows were becoming scarcer and scarcer on the rooftops, and the sewers were being depopulated. One ate whatever one could get. As he was strolling sadly along the outer boulevard one bright January morning, 
his hands in his trousers pockets and his stomach empty, Monsieur Morisseau, watchmaker by trade but local militiaman for the time being, stopped short before a fellow militiaman whom he recognized as a friend. It was Monsieur Sauvage, a Riverside acquaintance. Every Sunday before the war, Morisseau left at dawn, a bamboo pole in his hand, a tin box on his back. He would take the Argentai Railroad, get off at Cologne, and walk to Marant Island. As soon as he arrived at this ideal spot, he would start to fish. He fished until nightfall. Every Sunday, he would meet a stout, jovial little man, Monsieur Sauvage, a haberdasher in Rue Notre Dame de Lorette, another ardent fisherman. Often they spent half a day side by side, line in hand and feet dangling above the current. Inevitably, they had struck up a friendship. Some days they did not speak, sometimes they did, but they understood one another admirably without saying anything because they had similar tastes and responded to their surroundings in exactly the same way. Key on. We'll see why. On a spring morning toward 10 o'clock, when the young sun was drawing up from the tranquil stream wisps of haze which floated off in the direction of the current and was pouring down its vernal warmth on the backs of the two fanatical anglers, Morisot would sometimes say to his neighbor, Nice, isn't it? And Monsieur Sauvage would answer, There's nothing like it. And that was enough for them to understand and appreciate each other. On an autumn afternoon, when the sky, reddened by the setting sun, cast reflections of its scarlet clouds on the water, made the whole river crimson, lighted up the horizon, made the two friends look as ruddy as fire, and gilded the trees which were already brown and beginning to tremble with a wintry shiver, Monsieur Sauvage would look at Morisseau with a smile and say, Fine sight. And Morisseau, awed, would answer, It's better than the city, isn't it? Without taking his eyes from his float. As soon as they recognized one another, they shook hands energetically, touched at meeting under such changed circumstances. Monsieur Sauvage, with a sigh, grumbled, What goings on? 12.35. Morisseau groaned dismally, And what weather! This is the first fine day of the year. The sky was in fact blue and brilliant. They started to walk side by side, absent-minded and sad. Morisseau went on, And fishing! Ah, nothing but a pleasant memory. When'll we get back to it? asked Monsieur Sauvage. They went into a little cafe and had an absinthe, then resumed their stroll along the sidewalks. Morisseau stopped suddenly. How about another, eh? Monsieur Sauvage agreed, if you want, and they entered another wine shop. On leaving, they felt giddy, muddled, as one does after drinking on an empty stomach. It was mild. A caressing breeze touched their faces. The warm air completed what the absinthe had begun. Monsieur Sauvage stopped. Suppose we went. Went where? Fishing, of course. But where? Why, on our island. The French outposts are near Cologne. I know Colonel Dumoulin. They'll let us pass without any trouble. 1236. Morisot trembled with eagerness. Done. I'm with you. And they went off to get their tackle. All right, let's pause for just a second now and uh, and just pay attention at level one to what's going on. Terrible situation. Um, thankfully, we've not been in a situation like this in our lifetime where such tremendous deprivation. They're eating the sparrows and the rats out of the sewer because they're so hungry. You have two friends who from a previous time, before all this craziness with war happened, love to fish. They meet on the street, they have a couple of drinks, and they say, you know what? We ought to go fishing. Now the notion of going fishing will be symbolic at 2B. You can write this down. Two things. One, obviously you fish for food, right? So they can get something to eat. But more symbolically than that, the fishing will represent their friendship. The thing they love to do. Notice that we're told at the beginning of the story, they can sit for long hours 
and never say anything other than, it's a really beautiful day, isn't it? And the other one will say, yeah, it's a beautiful day. And that's all. In other words, words do not have to pass between them. They're that close. We could already jump down to 3B and ask, do you have a friend like this? Of course, we immediately at 3A think of the David Pythias story, right? Two friends. And of course, the title of the story here is Two Friends. So, we're going to go. Of course, let's put it in our notes at level one. What's dangerous about this? They're going to leave the city. They're going to go out into the countryside where the potentiality is they could run into trouble because obviously we have bad guys out there who are in fact keeping the city from allowing anybody in or out so they can starve everybody to death and force them to surrender. All right, let's go to work now. We'll enjoy what happens next, or will we, right? Disturbing story, no doubt. An hour later, they were walking side by side on the highway. They reached the villa which the colonel occupied. He smiled at their request and gave his consent to their whim. They started off again, armed with a pass. 1236, by the way, story. Soon they passed the outposts, went through the abandoned village of Cologne, and reached the edge of the little vineyards which sloped toward the Seine. It was about 11. Opposite, the village of Argentaille seemed dead. The heights of Orgemont and saint ouen dominated the whole countryside. The broad plain which stretches as far as Nanterre was empty, absolutely empty, with its bare cherry trees and its colorless fields. Pointing up to the heights, Monsieur Sauvage murmured, the Prussians are up there. And a feeling of uneasiness paralyzed the two friends as they faced this deserted region. The Prussians, they had never seen any, but for months they had felt their presence around Paris, ruining France, pillaging, massacring, starving the country, invisible and all-powerful. And a kind of superstitious terror was superimposed on the hatred which they felt for this unknown and victorious people. Morisot stammered, Say, suppose we met some of them. His Parisian jauntiness coming to the surface in spite of everything, Monsieur Sauvage answered, We'll offer them some fish. But they hesitated to venture into the country frightened by the silence all about them. Finally, Monsieur Sauvage pulled himself together. Come on, on our way, but let's go carefully. And they climbed over into a vineyard, bent double, crawling, taking advantage of the vines to conceal themselves, watching, listening. A stretch of bare ground had to be crossed to reach the edge of the river. They began to run, and when they reached the bank, they plunged down among the dry reeds. Morisot glued his ear to the ground and listened for sounds of anyone walking in the vicinity. He heard nothing. They were indeed alone, all alone. Reassured, they started to fish. Opposite them, Marant Island, deserted, hid them from the other bank. The little building which had housed a restaurant was shut up and looked as if it had been abandoned for years. Monsieur Sauvage caught the first gudgeon, Morisot got the second, and from then on they pulled in their lines every minute or two, with a silvery little fish squirming on the end, a truly miraculous draft. 1237. Skillfully, they slipped the fish into a sack made of fine net which they had hung in the water at their feet, and happiness pervaded their whole being, the happiness which seizes upon you when you regain a cherished pleasure of which you have long been deprived. The good sun was pouring down its warmth on their backs. They heard nothing more. They no longer thought about anything at all. They forgot about the rest of the world. They were fishing. All right, let's pause for a moment. Next part of the story, it's an easy three-part story. Next part of the story, they make it to the river safely, and there they fish. They have an amazing time. In other words, it's a way for them to go back to what life was like before all the insanity of war when the Prussians had attacked their city. And they love it. They are enjoying the experience of being together and of fishing. And then, part three of the story. Now, let's go ahead and put this at, uh, at 2B. 
All great stories have powerful conflicts. We have internal and external conflict, remember, right? Internal conflict, character versus self. External conflict, character versus another character. Character versus nature. Character versus society. I'm going to ask you to think about what kind of conflict we're messing around with. Now, obviously, we are in wartime, so we've obviously got some kind of sense of conflict already happening, but now we get to the real point of the story. Something tragic has got to happen. Let's keep reading. But suddenly, a dull sound which seemed to come from underground made the earth tremble. The cannon were beginning. Morisot turned and saw, over the bank to the left, the great silhouette of Mount Valerian, wearing a white plume on its brow, powder smoke which it had just spit out. And almost at once, a second puff of smoke rolled from the summit, and a few seconds after the roar, still another explosion was heard. Then more followed, and time after time, the mountain belched forth death-dealing breath, breathed out milky white vapor, which rose slowly in the calm sky and formed a cloud above the summit. Monsieur Sauvage shrugged his shoulders. There they go again, he said. As he sat anxiously watching his float bob up and down, Morisot was suddenly seized by the wrath which a peace-loving man will feel toward madmen who fight, and grumbled, Folks sure are stupid to kill one another like that. Monsieur Sauvage answered, they're worse than animals. And Morisot, who had just pulled in oblique, went on, and to think that it will always be like this as long as there are governments. Monsieur Sauvage stopped him. The Republic wouldn't have declared war. Morisot interrupted, under kings you have war abroad. Under the Republic you have war at home. And they started a leisurely discussion, unraveling great political problems with the same reasonableness of easygoing, limited individuals, and found themselves in agreement on the point that men would never be free. 1238. And Mount Valerian thundered unceasingly, demolishing French homes with its cannon, crushing out lives, putting an end to the dreams which many had dreamt, the joys which many had been waiting for, the happiness which many had hoped for, planting in wives' hearts, in maidens' hearts, in mothers' hearts, over there, in other lands, sufferings which would never end. The tragedy of war, right? That's life for you, opined Monsieur Sauvage. You'd better say, that's death for you, laughed Morisot. But they shuddered in terror when they realized that someone had just come up behind them. Uh-oh. And looking around, they saw four men standing almost at their elbows. Four tall men, armed and bearded, dressed like liveried servants, with flat caps on their heads, pointing rifles at them. The two fish lines dropped from their hands and floated off downstream. In a few seconds, they were seized, trussed up, carried off, thrown into a rowboat, and taken over to the island. And behind the building, which they had thought deserted, they saw a score of German soldiers. A kind of hairy giant who was seated astride a chair smoking a porcelain pipe asked them in excellent French, Well, gentlemen, have you had good fishing? Then a soldier put down at the officer's feet the sack full of fish which he had carefully brought along. The Prussian smiled. Uh-huh, I see that it didn't go badly. But we have to talk about another little matter. Listen to me and don't get excited. As far as I am concerned, you are two spies sent to keep an eye on me. I catch you and I shoot you. You are pretending to fish in order to conceal your business. You have fallen into my hands, so much the worse for you. War is like that. So let's pause for a moment, put it at level one. Notice, interesting. While they're literally watching cannons shoot at each other, they begin to have this conversation about how wretched war is and the fact that conflict being resolved through war inevitably leads to, to worse conflict, to worse situations. Maupassant, the pacifist, obviously making the argument that war is hell. 
then all of a sudden, they're caught. We immediately recognize the symbolism of fish in a net. We can put that in 2B right away. And they're brought in front of this, this leader, this commander, who will then accuse them of being spies and will say, for that, I have to shoot you. But now we're going to enjoin a moral dilemma. So write this down in 2B. Because this story is not yet ended. We have a very interesting moral dilemma that will now be open, that will now be expressed. Let's go ahead and uh, be uh, tortured a little bit by the power of this moral dilemma. But since you came out past the outposts, you have, of course, the password to return. Tell me that password, and I will pardon you. 1239. The two friends, side by side, pale, kept silent. A slight nervous trembling shook their hands. The officer went on. No one will ever know. You will go back placidly. The secret will disappear with you. If you refuse, it is immediate death. Choose. They stood motionless. The dilemma, Mouths right? shut. The Prussian quietly went on, stretching out his hand toward the stream. Remember that within five minutes you will be at the bottom of that river. Within five minutes. You have relatives, of course? Mount Valerian kept thundering. The two fishermen stood silent. The German gave orders in his own language. Then he moved his chair so as not to be near the prisoners, and twelve men took their places, twenty paces distant, rifles grounded. The officer went on. I give you one minute, not two seconds more. Then he rose suddenly, approached the two Frenchmen, took Morisseau by the arm, dragged him aside, whispered to him, Quick, the password? Your friend won't know. I'll pretend to relent. Morisseau answered not a word. 